section four of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three gaius gracchus part one in studying the career of tiberius gracchus we were investigating a very simple phenomenon the great tribune was aiming at nothing more than the redress of social and economic ills and had no thought of reconstructing the roman constitution when the provisions of that constitution stood in his way he recklessly overrode them but when they chanced to suit his purpose he utilized their most tiresome and absurd formalities to the utmost limit it was characteristic of the short-sighted tiberius to press the tribunitial authority to its most exaggerated extension one month by shutting up the law courts and the treasury while in the next he struck at the very roots of that authority and taught men to despise it by illegally deposing a tribune by the vote of the comitia whether such conduct was likely to strengthen the position of future tribunes he does not seem for one moment to have reflected but as a substitute for the old constitution which he was so ruthlessly breaking up tiberius had nothing to put forward when we examine his programme the list of reforms that he intended to bring forward in his second tribunate we find that it does not include any scheme for rearranging the machinery of the state but only certain proposals to change points of detail such as the composition of juries the conditions of military service and perhaps the limits of the franchise there was no attempt to settle the great problems of sovereignty and imperial administration which were the really pressing questions of the day apparently he was prepared to entrust the unwieldy public assembly with the details of the governance of the empire for which it was even more unfitted than was the oligarchic senate but in spite of tiberius's short-sightedness the after-effects of his career were such as to make constitutional changes likely and even necessary he had broken up for ever the tacit agreement between senate and people by which alone the clumsy machinery of the roman administration could be kept working he had shown that the comitia if galvanized into activity by a reckless and restless tribune was capable of reasserting its old theoretical powers and of passing laws in defiance of the senate and in opposition to the senate's dearest interests no state can contain two sovereigns and it had now to be settled which was really supreme at rome the senate according to the practice of the last two centuries or the people as theory required it was only necessary that a capable leader should again come forward to put himself at the head of the democratic party and then the struggle for sovereignty must force itself to the front as the main problem of the day leaders of a sort were not long wanting but at first they were mere noisy agitators who only stirred the surface of things gaius papirius carbo and marcus fulvius flaccus the immediate successors of the elder gracchus were not men of mark or ability their doings had little practical importance carbo tried to pass a declaratory law to the effect that tribunes might legally be re-elected year after year b c one thirty one he failed fell away from his democratic beliefs and relapsed for reasons obscure but probably discreditable into the ranks of the optimates a few years later however the bill was passed by other hands flaccus who was a genuine enthusiast but fickle of purpose and lacking in perseverance began to meddle with another and a much more important question the enfranchisement of the italian allies he brought in a bill for this very just and wise purpose saw it blocked by the tribunitial veto and then instead of persevering with it suddenly left rome and plunged into a series of campaigns in southern gaul b c one twenty five the senate deliberately threw the chance of military glory in his way by assigning him the gallic province he could not resist the opportunity and disappeared from home politics for two years the only practical result of his agitation was the rebellion of one isolated italian city fregoli 
which was crushed with ease by the praetor apimius b c one twenty five to one twenty four ten years passed away from the death of tiberius and then there arose a man who knew his own mind who accurately gauged the problems of the time and saw that not only the social and economic difficulties of rome but also the question of sovereignty must be faced if the democratic party was to triumph gaius gracchus was nine years younger than his brother tiberius and had been too young to aid him in his schemes though not too young to be appointed one of the famous triumvirs of the land commission that family party which had given so much offence to the optimates when the powers of the commission were gradually whittled away and its judicial duties assigned to the consuls who simply refused to discharge them gaius sank for a moment into obscurity but it was not for long like every other young roman of good family and active spirit he put himself in the regular political career and sued for the quaestorship as the first step in the cursus honorum once started he was bound to go far gaius was not a mere enthusiast and humanitarian like his brother he was a clever many-sided wary man who saw all the dangers of the task he was going to take in hand and faced them under the stimulus of ambition and revenge rather than from benevolence and patriotism we shall see that all his career was coloured by these motives a fact which accounts for the many deliberately immoral measures that are to be found in his legislation for some years after his brother's death he took no very prominent part in public affairs yet he did not keep himself so secluded and obscure as plutarch makes out we know for example that he made an oration in favour of carbo's bill concerning re-election of the tribunate and that he spoke against the detestable law of junius penis b c one twenty six which expelled italian residents from rome gaius took the quaestorship in the year of the law of penis and was sent to serve in sardinia under the proconsul aurelius orestes he was kept in that unhealthy and uninteresting land for two years as his office was prolonged for a second term owing to the jealousy of the senate who were glad to keep away from the capital one who bore the dreaded name of gracchus thus as it chanced gaius was absent from italy during the franchise agitation of fulvius flaccus and the revolt of fregoli this fact did not prevent the optimates from accusing him of having had a guilty knowledge of the intentions of the rebel city he won golden opinions for his efficient financial administration in sardinia as well as for his personal integrity he was the only quaestor as he himself said who went out with a full purse and came back with an empty one after returning from sardinia in b c one twenty four gaius stood for the tribunate for the ensuing year and obtained the office without much trouble so popular was his name among the multitude the only effect of a bitter opposition to him started by the optimates was that he was returned fourth on the list instead of at the head of the poll when once launched on the sea of domestic politics gaius atoned by his unceasing activity for the long delay that he had made before plunging into the troubled waters he was the most restless and eager of men beside him we are told his brother tiberius had always appeared mild moderate and conciliatory these are hardly the epithets that we should apply to the author of the confiscation of the domain land and the deposer of octavius but the comparison enables us to understand the terrible vehemence of his younger brother gaius had no moments of rest or quiet after he had once put himself forward as the friend of the people his activity was militant and aggressive his eloquence bitter and vituperative he was always working himself up into the fine fury that ends in hysterics we are told that he was aware of the fact and that when he came down to the comitia to speak he stationed a discreet retainer with a pitch-pipe behind him whose duty was to give a warning note whenever the oration was tending to become a screech unfortunately like the archbishop of granada in lesage's story he did not invariably accept the criticism of his underling he was always on the edge of overemphasis 
first of all romans as we read he strode from one end of the rostra to another while speaking and cast his toga from off his shoulders by the vehemence of his action his enemies compared him to cleon the blustering demagogue of ancient athens it is strange that a man of such a high-strung nature should have kept back from politics so long his own explanation of the abstention was that he felt that he was well nigh the last of his race save himself and his young son the male line of the gracchi had died out though his father the consul had left behind him no less than twelve children cicero used to tell the story that gaius had sworn after his brother's disastrous end to hold aloof from the political life but that his resolution was broken down by a vision he thought as he slept that tiberius stood before him and cried why this long lingering gaius there is no alternative the fates have decreed the same career for each of us to spend our lives and meet our deaths in vindicating the rights of the roman people dreams are often the reflection of the subjects on which the mind has been perpetually brooding in the waking hours and the tale well expresses the blending of motives in the mind of gaius he felt that it was his duty to avenge his brother and he was deeply stirred by seeing the democratic party mute and helpless for lack of a leader and a programme when he felt that he could so easily supply both these wants ambition and revenge were probably at the bottom of his resolve to a greater measure than he himself was aware whatever was the spark that kindled this eager and susceptible temperament into a flame there can be no doubt that from the moment of his election to the tribunate gaius displayed the restless energy of a fanatic he took in hand no less a scheme than the absorption into his own hands of the whole administration foreign and domestic of the roman empire his plan was to overrule the senate by the simple device of keeping perpetual possession of the tribunate a thing which was now perfectly legal owing to the law which had been passed since his brother's death as tribune he would bring in an unending series of laws and decrees dealing directly with all the departments of state so that the senate should have no right to meddle with anything if the sovereign people claimed and used its power to settle every detail of the governance of the empire there would be no room for senatorial interference Momsen has maintained that this scheme was a deliberate anticipation of the monarchy of the caesars and that gaius by proposing to hold perpetual office as the sole guide and arbiter of those at whose fiat the assembly should pass laws was practically intending to make himself tyrant of rome this however is unfair to gracchus it would be more true to say that he aimed at occupying at rome somewhat the same position that pericles had once held at athens the athenian had been strategos year after year and had guided for half a lifetime the votes of the ecclesia yet no one save comic poets called him a tyrant he was prostates ton daemon as the greeks phrased it but that is a very different thing from holding a tyranny what gaius gracchus craved was much the same position but he had not the calm wisdom of pericles and a man of his vehement and reckless temper was certain ere long to fall out with his supporters and wreck his career we have said that there was a strong element of revenge among the motives which stirred up gracchus to put himself at the head of the democratic party his first two laws display it very clearly one of them was a declaratory bill which reenacted the old constitutional principle that any magistrate who in his year of office had put to death or banished roman citizens without a trial should be called to account before the comitia this measure was aimed at the consul propilius who though he had not been concerned in the riot where tiberius met his end had subsequently seized and executed many of the reformers partisans the ex-magistrate recognized the intent of the law and was perfectly conscious of the flagrant illegality of what he had done ten years before and of the probability of his conviction for high treason he fled out of italy into exile without waiting to be indicted 
his fate was well deserved for the conduct of his party had been abominable after the death of tiberius further executions had not been required and if they had been there was no excuse for not proceeding according to proper forms of trial but the second law of gaius was by no means so righteous it was aimed at the perfectly respectable and blameless tribune octavius who had opposed tiberius on the question of the agrarian law and had been deposed by him in such an illegal fashion the bill now brought forward was to the effect that any magistrate whom the roman people had removed from office for any cause was to be for the future incapable of holding office again this was a mere persecution for octavius had done nothing more than exercise a right which he undoubtedly possessed in a conscientious if somewhat obstinate fashion all our authorities agree that there was no ground for believing that he had been actuated by spite or corrupt motives it would appear that gaius found that public opinion was not with him when he attacked octavius or that he grew ashamed on second thoughts of this vindictive measure at any rate he dropped the bill announcing that he did so in deference to the wishes of his mother cornelia at which as we are told the people showed themselves perfectly satisfied the other legislative proposals of the first tribunate of gaius gracchus are of very various kinds covering all sorts of different spheres of imperial and domestic administration they plainly show that the vehement young tribune thought nothing too small or too great to be dealt with by the assembly under his own superintendence as prime minister of the people it is unfortunate that the historians on whom we have to rely for information do not enable us to make out the exact sequence in which the various laws were passed we have to deal with them in classes rather than in strict order of time in some ways the most important of all was a bill which in spite of all that the advocates of gaius can allege appears to have been simply and solely intended to commend him to the populace as the true friend who had once and for all filled their stomachs he proposed a lex frumentaria which provided that corn the tithe corn of the sicilian cities stored in the granaries of the state should be sold to any citizen who applied for it at six and one-third asses per modius each man was allowed to buy five modii a month in order to prevent swindling and speculation the buyer had to visit the granary himself and receive the corn in person thus the bill profited the urban mob alone since they were the only citizens who lived near enough to the fount of supply to be able to turn it to account now six and a third asses per modius was as it would appear a rate which represented about one-half the normal price of corn in the roman market during an average year the measure was equivalent therefore to the free gift of half his daily loaf to every urban voter the proletariat thought the bill a most admirable one and its author was hailed wherever he appeared as the true friend of the people he had appealed to them in a manner which even the simplest could understand and their gratitude reminds us of the famous cry of the portuguese army when it saluted its commander with the shout long live marshal beresford who takes care of our bellies the voters of the Sabura were blameless they knew no better when they aided their leader to carry through his most unhappy bill but gaius must bear a very heavy burden of reproach for this miserable bid for popularity not only had he devised the surest means of demoralizing the urban multitude but he had also dealt the last death blow to italian agriculture more than any other single man he was responsible for the growth of that mass of paupers asking for nothing but panem et circenses which in a few generations was to represent the sovereign people of rome when once the indigent multitude had begun to expect food from the state at an artificial price it was not likely that they would stop clamouring till they got it for nothing the demagogues who pandered to them by continually increasing the dole were the legitimate offspring of gaius gracchus the case against him is made even worse by the fact that at the same moment when he began to distribute the tithe corn at half price he also made a great parade of re-enacting his brother's agrarian law 
he declared that the restoration of the old yeoman class was as dear to his heart as it had been to that of tiberius he restored the full powers of the land commission for the distribution of what remained of the public domains and commenced once more to plant out farmers on small allotments this was sheer economic lunacy for how could farming pay in central italy if the state entered the field as a competitor against the local agriculturalist and swamped the roman market with corn sold at half price if gaius really supposed that it was any use to send forth new farmers at the moment when he was underbidding them by the institution of the corn dole he must have been an idiot if he set the land commission to work with a full knowledge that all its efforts must be futile he must have been a deliberate impostor knowing the cleverness of the man we are forced to conclude that the latter alternative is the nearer to the truth he probably reenacted his brother's law for purely political reasons not because he thought that it would have any good effect but because it looked well in the democratic program his real scheme for relieving the economic pressure was of quite a different kind he intended to dispatch the ruined italian farmers overseas to form new colonies in the provinces where their efforts would not be sterilized by the unnatural condition of the local roman market this was the true way of relieving the distress of the yeoman class they could not hold their own in italy without protection which it was certain that gaius's friends in the urban multitude would never grant them but on the fertile soil of africa they might do well enough accordingly gaius set his colleague the tribune rubrius to introduce a bill for the founding of a colony on a very large scale there were to be allotments for no less than six thousand citizens on the deserted site of ancient carthage if the settlers failed to maintain themselves as agriculturalists they would have a good second chance of succeeding as traders for it was inevitable that some great town must grow up again at a point of the mediterranean so central and so well suited for maritime traffic so far gaius was right within two centuries the restored carthage was to be one of the greatest cities of the empire but it was not to call a Gracchus its founder other colonies were to be planted in italy itself the places chosen were tarentum and capua these new settlements can never have been intended to live on agriculture they were clearly designed to become what each of them had been in the past great urban centres of trade the old capua and tarentum had not died natural deaths the one had come to a violent end because it had in the hour of danger deserted rome during the hannibalic war the other though not quite so harshly treated in a political sense had been practically ruined by its protracted sieges and the forcible diversion of its commerce to the rival port of brundisium now capua was an open village without even a legal existence and tarentum a decayed fishing haven but gaius thought that there was an opening for a great market town in the midst of the campanian plain and for a flourishing port on the ionian sea if strengthened by a draft of roman citizens the cities might rise again if only from the mere convenience of their sites for the colonial schemes of gaius both in italy and in africa we have nothing but praise he had hit upon the true method of relieving the misery of the proletariat and if he had been enabled to carry out his designs there would have been an opening provided for every citizen who was willing to work and disliked the miserable life of the dole-fed pauper there are other laws to be placed to his credit which show that when his mind was not warped by revenge or ambition he was a true statesman of the first rank one was destined to complete the road system of italy which had grown up very much at haphazard and still left many regions practically isolated from the main arteries of communication admiring biographers describe to us the excellence of his roads drawn in a straight line through the country wonderfully built with a bed of binding gravel below and a paved chaussee above when a ravine was met it was filled up with rubble when a watercourse it was spanned by a bridge levelled and brought to a perfect parallel the high road represented a regular and even elegant prospect for mile after mile there were pillars of stone to mark the distances and directions and horse-blocks at convenient spots to enable the traveller to mount with ease 
another law that was obviously beneficial and had been long called for was one for relieving the rank and file of the army from the burden of providing themselves with clothing in the old days when the citizen soldier spent a few months in the field at no great distance from his home and was disbanded at the coming of winter the custom had been natural and reasonable but to expect a conscript sent for six years to spain to keep himself clothed from his modest pay was absurd not only was this boon secured to the soldiery but other laws of gracchus mitigated the severity of conscription securing that no man should be forced to serve before he had attained the legal age and reducing the number of years for which he could be kept on continuous service less happily inspired was another bill which seems to have given the soldiers at the wars the right to appeal against any sentence of death passed by their general such a provision would certainly prove detrimental to discipline there are occasions when it is absolutely necessary that the commander should be able to punish mutiny or cowardice on the spot by the extreme penalty and to allow an appeal against him is preposterous as a matter of fact the law was not always observed there are cases known long after this time in which military executions took place on the largest scale crassus in the servile war once decimated a whole cohort for gross cowardice in the field but the most important of all the legislative enactments of gaius gracchus were those by which he set to work to modify the constitution by cutting down the powers of the senate his chief device for this purpose was to raise up a new corporation in the state with interests which should be so different from those of the senate that it might be trusted to act as a check on that body it was in the equestrian order that he found the materials for this counterpoise in early days the equites were simply the cavalry of the roman army every man with the equestrian census had to serve as a horse soldier whether he were senator landholder or capitalist but by b c one twenty three the equites had become a very anomalous body they had practically ceased to have a military organization the last occasion on which we hear of them taking the field as a separate corps was in the siege of numantia the roman burgess cavalry had been entirely superseded by squadrons raised from among the allies nor did the equites any longer number senators in their ranks since b c one twenty nine no senator could be a knight the body now consisted of those men of wealth who had not been called up to sit in the senate it was heterogeneous containing two very different classes of members the more reputable half of it comprised the larger landowners of non-senatorial rank throughout roman italy the other half was composed of the great capitalists merchants and contractors of the city the urban and the rural knights had few common privileges or functions the only occasions when they had occasion to meet was when the censor called them up to his quinquennial review or when the equestrian centuries had to give their votes in the comitia cantoriata they had very little cohesion or esprit de corps gaius resolved to make this wealthy but ill-compacted class into a corporation with common honorary rights and practical advantages the part of it with which he had mainly to deal was the capitalist class in the city for just as the urban proletariat being always on the spot came to style itself the roman people so the speculators and contractors of the capital came to speak of themselves as if they were the whole equestrian body the most important of the laws by which gracchus designed to sow discord between the senate and the equites was that by which the control of the law courts was transferred from the one to the other body hitherto senators alone were placed upon the album judicum and allowed to serve as jurymen the results had been discreditable of late years and in particular the provincials complained that a senatorial jury would never convict a defaulting governor for embezzlement and oppression there had been a particularly bad case of the sort just before gaius received the tribunate manlius aquilius governor of asia had been acquitted in spite of the fact that the provincials proved against him a number of scandalous acts of misgovernment his acquittal had been secured by wholesale bribery and the decision had been so iniquitous that the reputation of senatorial juries had sunk to a very low ebb 
it was easy therefore to attack them on high moral grounds and gaius's talent for vituperative eloquence had free scope his line of argument may be guessed from a fragment of one of his speeches against the senate which has survived no senator troubles himself about public affairs for nothing he observed and in the case before us an arbitration concerning territories in asia minor the honourable gentlemen may be divided into three classes those who voted aye have been bribed by one claimant those who voted no by the other and those who did not vote at all by both and these last are the most cunning of all for they have persuaded each party that they abstained in his interest saying that if they had voted at all they must have done so for the other side the senatorial juries had undoubtedly been most unsatisfactory but the equestrian juries which gaius substituted for them were even worse there is no reason to believe that the tribune was unaware of this fact for in reference to this law he is recorded to have remarked that he had cast daggers into the forum with which the two orders should lacerate each other clearly his purpose was to brew mischief for the benefit of the senate rather than to secure any advantage for the citizens or the provincials to put the control of the law courts into the hands of the urban knights for the rural knights did not count had the worst possible effect the typical equus was a good deal more of a money-lender speculator and financial agent than of a mere merchant his interests were as much opposed to those of the provincials as they were to those of the senate his main wish was to exploit the empire for the benefit of his own class it is difficult to construct any parallel for modern times which can bring home to the reader the exact meaning of the surrender of justice into the hands of the equites some faint adumbration of the results may be realized by imagining what might happen in england if all juries had to be chosen exclusively from members of the stock exchange whenever any financial question might be in dispute there would be a tendency even in honest men to decide in favour of their own class interests the roman publicanus was little influenced either by delicacy or by regard for public opinion the result of giving him judicial omnipotence was merely that he abused it for his own interest rather more than his senatorial predecessors had done the equite says appian soon adopted the senator's system of bribery and no sooner had they experienced the pleasures of unlimited gains than they proceeded to strive after them far more shamelessly than had ever been done before they used to set up suborned accusers against the senators they not merely tyrannized over them in the law courts but openly insulted them the old grievance had been that bad provincial governors escaped punishment for their misdeeds owing to the misplaced tenderness of their friends on the jury the new grievance was that any one who did not play into the hands of the equites and grant them whatever they asked was prosecuted and condemned however blameless his conduct might have been it took some years for the system of blackmailing to reach its perfection but what it grew to may be judged from the case of rutilius rufus this virtuous administrator had set himself to protect the provincials of asia from the extortions of the publicani he came home bringing with him the blessings of the whole land but on his return the financiers had him accused of all things in the world of embezzlement and extortion he was promptly condemned though he brought representatives of every class of the provincials to bear witness that he was the best friend they had ever known and retired to live in honoured exile among the very people whom he was supposed to have oppressed End of section four. section five of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles omen this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three gaius gracchus part two doubtless gaius did not foresee the full harvest of scandals which was destined to spring up from his treatment of the law courts but he must have known that he was putting power into the hands of a class that could not be trusted for the results therefore he must take the responsibility 
Meanwhile, he obtained the immediate profit that he desired. The Equites supported the tribune when votes were required, and received from him in return whatever they wished. How harmful to the state were these things which they wished may be seen from the case of the Asiatic taxes. Since their annexation in B.C. 133, or rather since their rescue from the hands of the rebel Aristonicus in B.C. 129, the cities of Asia had been paying to Rome a fixed tribute of moderate amount. But the knights loved the system of tax farming, and suggested to Gaius that it might be introduced into this wealthiest of all the provinces. He consented, and by his law, de provincia Asia cancoribus locanda, instituted a most detestable form of it. Not only was the tithe system imposed on Asia, and the administration of it farmed out, but it was ordained that the bidding for the tithes should take place before the censors at Rome, not at Pergamus or Ephesus, and that the whole revenue of the province should be contracted for en bloc. The object of this strange arrangement was that provincial competition for the contracts might be excluded, firstly by the fact that the auction was held in Italy, and secondly by the enormous capital required, for only a syndicate of Roman millionaires could afford to contemplate the tremendous sums that had to be dealt with, when the land revenues of the whole of the two hundred cities of Asia were handled in a single contract. By means of Gaius's law, the old kingdom of Pergamus, the last region of the Hellenic East, which had preserved its prosperity, was reduced in a single generation to a deplorable state of misery. The best commentary on the new system of government is that, when in the year B.C. 88 a foreign enemy entered Asia, the whole countryside rose like one man in his favor, and massacred in a single day the 80,000 Roman traders, officials, and tax collectors who dwelt among them. The great tribune was re-elected for a second term of office without any difficulty, and his work in B.C. 122 was a continuation of that of the previous twelve months. Several of the laws of which we have already spoken only came to full fruition in the latter year. Gaius was now thoroughly well established in power as the people's prime minister. He was commencing to add a whole bundle of standing offices to his main title of tribune, being triumvir on the agrarian board, chief commissioner of roads, and official superintendent of the new colonies that were to be founded. Plutarch, speaking in a somewhat exaggerated strain, asserts that he was occupying a quasi-royal position, that he had monarchicae tis iscus, but he forgets to point out that he was destitute of one most important element of power. He had no regular armed force at his back, only the fickle bands of the urban multitude. The Roman constitution, as time was to show, could only be overthrown by an imperator with legions at his heels. The orator, who had but his ready tongue and his chance mob of partisans, was really unequal to the task of upsetting the old regime. But meanwhile his power and activity were very terrifying to the Senate. Those who most feared the man were struck with his amazing industry and the faculty with which he dispatched the most diverse kinds of business. He lived in the center of a sort of court, frequented equally by foreign ambassadors, architects, engineers, military men, and philosophers. He had business with all these classes, receiving them all with urbanity, and surprised them all by his interest in and mastery of their various provinces of knowledge. It was easy for his enemies to say that there was a royal court already established in Rome, with nothing wanting save the diadem. During his second tribunate, Gaius was engaged both in completing his legislation in behalf of the Equites and in developing his great colonial schemes, especially that for the establishment of the new city that was to be called Junonia on the site of Carthage. But he was also launching out on to the development of another item of the democratic program. He wished to carry out that liberal extension of the citizenship to the Italian allies, which had been growing more and more of a necessity during the last fifty years. Tiberius Gracchus, if we may trust Velius, had broached the idea in B.C. 133. 
Fulvius Flaccus had certainly brought it to the front in B.C. 125, with no result save the unfortunate revolt of Fregellae. But Gaius had much more favourable opportunities than either his brother or Flaccus, for he had secured a much more complete control over the Comitia than either of them had ever possessed. The project was one which was eminently deserving of support. In former days the Roman people had been fairly generous with the franchise, not only had all the latin and etruscan districts around the city been granted the full citizenship one after another but there were ways provided in which individual members of allied states further afield might become incorporated in the body of roman burgesses but this wise liberality had gradually gone out of fashion just as roman citizenship grew more and more valuable owing to the ever-increasing profits of empire it became more and more difficult to obtain. No new territory in Latium or Etruria had been taken into the state boundaries since B.C. 188, and it was growing much harder for the individual citizen of an allied community to slip into the Burgess body. The fact was that the Romans in ancient days, when fighting for existence, had been eager to strengthen themselves by multiplying their numbers, now that they had acquired an empire, they were less eager to share their advantages with others. The knowledge that discontent at their niggardliness was ever growing more lively among the Italian states had not yet begun to alarm the ordinary Roman, whether optimate or democrat. The city rabble were just as unconcerned about it as the most purblind reactionary in the Senate. Gaius Gracchus, therefore, had to convert his own party to the policy of liberal treatment for the Allies. It was true that his brother may have advocated their cause, and that others among the leaders of the party, notably the energetic but unstable Fulvius Flaccus, were convinced of its righteousness. But the weapon with which Gaius had to win his victories was the urban multitude, the one constant element in the composition of the Comitia he thought that he could carry it with him, even when he was advocating measures which were not directly and obviously profitable to itself. Indeed, he imagined that he had bought it forever, belly and soul, by the gift of the corn dole. He was so far right that a great portion of the populace was ready to stick to him through thick and thin, and to vote for whatever bill he might choose to bring forward. Unfortunately for himself and for Rome, he was to discover that the whole body was not so loyal, and that men who could be bribed once to vote for the democratic side might be influenced on another occasion by equally corrupt inducements held out by the enemy. Gaius was always styling the urban multitude the people. He was destined to find that it might be truer to call them the rabble. The very moderate and statesmanlike form in which Gaius proposed to deal with the franchise question was to bestow the full citizenship on the Latins and the rights hitherto held by the Latins on the remainder of the Italian allies. The Latins now represented not the old thirty cities of the Latin League, which had long been taken into the Roman state, but the numerous colonies with Latin rights, that is, the Ius Canubii and Ius Cumercii, which were scattered all over Italy. They only wanted the power to vote in the Comitia to make them full citizens. The practical as opposed to the political advantages of the status were already in their possession. On the other hand, the main body of the Italian allies were to receive the commercial and civil privileges hitherto confined to the Latins, but were not to be introduced into the tribes or permitted to swamp the public assembly by their enormous numbers. No doubt Gaius contemplated the arrival of the day, when they too might become Romans. But he had no wish to hurry matters and intended to bring about the complete Romanization of Italy by gradual emancipation. Only after a longer or shorter training as Latins would the multitudes of central and southern Italy be permitted to obtain the full franchise. All this was prudent, moderate, and far-sighted, but unfortunately there was little in the scheme to rouse enthusiasm among the more sordid members of the democratic party the mass of demoralized urban voters who formed the habitual majority in ordinary meetings of the comitia in their ignorant selfishness they looked upon the matter from a very narrow point of view 
the individual roman citizen they thought would suffer if the number of his equals were increased there would be more hands among which the bribes of the would-be consul and praetor and the public distribution of money and food made by the state would have to be divided the consul fanius though he had been elected by the assistance of gracchus himself led the opposition he put the question in a nutshell when he asked the multitude whether they had reflected that by passing such a bill they would soon have the latins elbowing them out of their places in the comitia crowding them out of the circus and theatre and eating up their corn this sordid and cynical appeal went to the heart of the plebeians and the majority of them soon showed that they were ready to refuse support in this matter to the leader who vainly believed that he had purchased their perpetual allegiance while the franchise question was still in an early stage a new figure appeared upon the scene to the great perplexity of gracchus this was a certain marcus livius drusus a tribune of whom little had hitherto been known he did not attempt to resist gaius by the method of mere stolid opposition which octavius had used ten years before against the reformer's elder brother his plan was one which had often been tried in greek politics the counter demagogue had been a well-known figure at athens though he was as yet unfamiliar at rome drusus professed to be even more devoted to the people than his colleague and to be ready to go yet farther in the paths of innovation only on two questions that of the founding of colonies beyond the sea and that of granting the franchise to the italians did he profess to differ from him of both these measures he disapproved but he had his own substitutes ready both for propitiating his allies and for providing land for the would-be colonists with the object then of showing that he was a truer and more liberal friend of the people than gaius himself livius drusus announced his intention of bringing forward a whole series of popular measures perhaps the most prominent of these was a huge scheme for colonization inside italy instead of choosing only two places with particularly favorable sites as gracchus had done he announced that he would establish no less than twelve colonies in the peninsula each of them to hold no less than three thousand citizens the scheme was wholly impractical for these were to be agricultural and not trading centres and agriculture as we have already seen was ruined beyond redemption but the populace had not yet grasped the fact and the plan seemed to them far more attractive than anything that gaius had proposed equally popular and equally futile was another bill which was to turn all the farms which had already been distributed by the land commissions into the private property of their occupiers tiberius gracchus had made a great point of imposing a rent upon them in order to remind the farmers that they were the tenants of the state and not full freeholders he had also prohibited them from selling their land for he had feared that they would be prone to dispose of their holdings at the first bad season if they were given the chance so that the latifundia would in a short time be reconstituted it is probable that ten years of unprofitable farming had already disgusted great numbers of the settlers of b c one thirty three and one thirty two that they were now wishing to throw up the holdings for which they had once clamoured so loudly at any rate there is no doubt that drusus's proposal to make the land alienable and to abolish the modest rent imposed by tiberius acquired a certain cheap popularity there were other bills brought forward at the same time of which we have no accurate details one was intended to propitiate the allies for being refused the franchise it provided that latin soldiers should no longer be liable to the punishment of scourging by roman officers and probably their status in other ways was to be brought nearer to that of their comrades who possessed the full citizenship in proposing each of his laws drusus took great care to point out to the people that he was acting with the full consent and approbation of the senate he wished to produce the impression that popular legislation could be procured from other sources than the democratic party and succeeded in his aim the majority of the urban multitude were too stupid to see that when the competition was ended by the removal or death of gracchus their noble friends would relapse 
into their former state of apathy as to the needs of the people it has been suggested by some historians that drusus was not a deliberate charlatan playing a part but a real though misguided enthusiast who was unconsciously made the tool of the senate it has been pointed out that several of the laws which he proposed in b c one twenty two were reintroduced a generation later by his son who was a genuine democrat of the most enthusiastic sort and it is suggested that the elder drusus believed in his own panacea and passed it on as a sacred secret to his son and heir but on the whole it is safer to believe the roman historians when they tell us that the colleague of gracchus was well aware of what he was doing and had no more worthy aim than to undermine his rival's position by outbidding him in the market of popular favour the waning power of gaius over the multitude was shown most clearly by the fate of his bill for the enfranchisement of the latins when it was brought forward drusus announced that he should veto it there was no explosion of popular wrath for the fact was that the majority of the multitude were apathetic on the point or even held that the good things of empire had better be distributed among a few than among many roman citizens gaius saw no opportunity of assailing his colleague he made no attempt to demolish him as his brother of old had demolished octavius public feeling would have been against him if he had tried instead of starting a furious agitation on behalf of the italians as his friend and colleague fulvius flaccus proposed he went off to africa to superintend the foundation of his new colony of junonia thus the democratic party in the city was left in the temporary charge of flaccus this was unfortunate for the ex-consul was a man equally devoid of tact and of prudence and prone to plunge into profitless violence when freed from the restraints imposed by his more statesmanlike friend gaius probably supposed that nothing would commend him more surely to the people than the sight of the new carthaginian colony inaugurated with all possible pomp and splendour and flourishing from the first as it was bound to do if only it obtained a fair start he marked out the site on an even larger scale than the rubrian law had named and made a great parade of assembling colonists from all over italy apparently permitting latins as well as romans to send in their names all the proper ceremonies were carried out the flag was planted the furrow driven round an enormous space of ground and the boundary stones set up when however gracchus returned from africa to rome he found that his demonstration had completely missed fire the most absurd rumours had been put about by his opponents a legend had cropped up that scipio had solemnly cursed the site of carthage when he captured it in b c one forty six and that nothing could prosper on such unlucky ground it was said that a gale had torn down the standard which gracchus had erected a fact quite possible in itself but rendered less likely by the additional garnishment of the story which said that the boundary stones of the new colony had been dug up at night by wolves if wolves there were they must clearly have been two-legged roman wolves of the optimate breed nevertheless these silly tales seem to have had their effect and to have loosened the hold of gaius on the comitia when the tribunitial elections came on and he stood for the third time he failed to be chosen it is said that he had really a majority of votes but that drusus or some other tribune who presided at the poll made a fraudulent and unjust return that such a thing should have been possible shows that at least the suffrages of the people must have been much divided for if gaius had possessed his former ascendancy no one would have dared juggle with the votes gracchus was appalled with this misadventure he bore the disappointment with great impatience and when he saw his adversaries laughing told them with an air of insolence that they should soon be laughing on the wrong side of their mouths meanwhile he had only a short time left in which the invaluable tribunitial position was still his own on the tenth of december b c one twenty two he would become a private person again and would not only lose his power of legislation but become liable to prosecution for any illegal acts which his enemies might choose to allege against him 
the last months of his office seem to have been spent in a bitter personal struggle with drusus each produced strings of popular laws to tempt the appetite of the people and gaius had the disappointment of seeing himself outbid by a rival whose main advantage was that he was prepared to bring forward projects possible or impossible with no thought of the consequences as a good greek scholar gracchus must have recognized that he had fallen into the unenviable position of cleon in the knights of aristophanes his stewardship was about to be taken from him and he would soon be obliged to give an account of all his doings at last the fatal day came round and gaius ceased to be the sacrosanct representative of the roman people and became once more a private citizen it is probable that even if he had kept quiet his adversaries would now have found some excuse for falling upon him like his brother tiberius twelve years before he had made too many enemies but he did not give them the opportunity of leaving him alone within a few days of the coming of the new year b c one twenty one he was engaged in bitter civil strife with them for he had still plenty of partisans at his back the better men of the democratic party still believed in him and among the multitude there were many whose profound hatred of the senate and all its works had led them to distrust the gifts of drusus most important of all there was a lively agitation outside rome the latins were bitterly vexed that the citizenship which had been dangled before them for the second time had now been again withdrawn from their reach their old friend fulvius flaccus got into communication with them and assured them that he had not forgotten them and still hoped to defend their cause but organization was needed to bring their forces to bear and of organizing power there seems to have been little or none on the democratic side the moment that the new magistrates of b c one twenty one were installed in office an effort was made by the optimates to rescind as much as they dared of the gracchan legislation the equites were too strong to be lightly meddled with and the laws passed in their favour were left alone it was still necessary to keep the urban multitude divided so no attempt was made to touch the corn dole any hint of such a design would have thrown the whole mass back into the arms of gracchus it was accordingly against the colonial scheme that the optimates opened their batteries formal representations were made to the augurs that the omens at the foundation of junonia had been unfavourable and all the stories about the gale the broken flagstaff and the uprooted boundary stones were brought forward the augurs made the reply that was required the auspices of junonia had been most unfavourable and clearly showed the anger of the gods at the unhallowed attempt to build upon the cursed soil accordingly the consul opimius who assumed the lead in all the proceedings against gracchus took the opinion of the senate on the question whether it would not be right to annul the rubrian law and disestablish the new colony the fathers fell in with his design and granted him an auctoritas for the introduction of an act of repeal it was accordingly brought before the people by the tribune marcus minucius this brought gaius to the front the scheme for transmarine colonization was very dear to him in it as he believed lay the true remedy for the economic distress of the roman people when gracchus and fulvius flaccus says appian discerned that their great project was to be thwarted they became like madmen and ran about declaring that all the stories about the evil omens were lies invented by the senate they announced their intention of opposing the act of repeal by every means in their power and began when it was too late to organize their partisans for the fray this was precisely what their enemies had hoped if they could be goaded into any act of violence they could be accused of treason and doomed to suffer the same lot that had fallen on tiberius gracchus and his followers twelve years before neither party made any attempt to disguise their intention of using force if it should become necessary the optimates secretly armed their clients and slaves on the other hand flaccus sent the word round rural italy that strong arms were needed at rome it is said that hundreds of his partisans disguised as labourers 
came up to the city on the day when the bill was to be brought forward and that there were more allies than citizens among these able-bodied visitors gaius appears to have disliked this open appeal to violence he felt that the democrats would be putting themselves in the wrong if they began the fray and seems to have discouraged his followers by his fervid appeals to them not to take the offensive but the die was cast the more enthusiastic democrats were determined to fight and came down to the assembly armed with daggers and staves as if a conflict was absolutely certain they were so far right and their leader was so far wrong that in the present strained situation of affairs there was no hope of a peaceful issue on the day of voting the optimates and the democrats faced each other more like two armies than two orderly political factions on each side the lethal weapons were barely disguised beneath the broad folds of the togas the only doubt was whether the enemies or the partisans of gracchus would strike the first blow as a matter of fact the democrats put themselves in the wrong by opening the battle by a wanton murder the consul opimius had opened the proceedings by the usual sacrifice in the porch of the capitoline temple when he had done one of his servants a certain quintus antullius who was carrying away the entrails of the victim rudely pushed through the front rank of the democrats crying stand off ye bad citizens and make way for honest men it is said that he emphasized his insulting words by making a gesture of contempt in the very face of gracchus at this gaius gave him a fierce look whereupon an overzealous follower stepped forward and stabbed the man through and through with a dagger antullius fell dead between the two parties with the sacred entrails still in his hand prepared for strife as all those present had been they were yet shocked by this sacrilegious murder no malay followed but the enemies stood gazing upon each other and no one dared to strike a second blow at this moment a sudden thunderstorm burst over the capital and awed by the manifest wrath of jupiter the whole armed multitude melted homeward in the drenching rain the day ended without the expected battle but blood had been shed and the optimates were able to cast the responsibility for the commencement of civil strife upon their adversaries it is certain that if antullius had been left alone the contest would merely have broken out a few minutes later for both crowds were bent on mischief and the most trivial incident would have sufficed to set them by the ears morally speaking the guilt may be equally divided between them for each had come down prepared to fight and if the democrats had not struck the first blow the optimates would have done so a little later both the consul opimius and the headstrong fulvius flaccus had deliberately got ready for battle and whatever may have been the private feelings of gaius it is certain that he came down armed to support his friends his admirers have alleged that he was precipitated into civil war against his will his detractors have quite as much to say for their view when they assert that he lost his opportunity for carrying out a coup d'etat because a reckless fool struck too soon and placed his whole party at a moral disadvantage there can be no doubt that the dagger thrust dealt by this overzealous democrat ruined his party it was to little purpose that gaius went down to the forum the same afternoon and tried to explain away what had happened as a deplorable accident for which he was not responsible many who might otherwise have supported him had been profoundly shocked and it is impossible for the man who has placed himself at the head of an armed mob to disavow any connection with its atrocities just as robert emmet was responsible for the murder of lord kilwarden though he may not himself have thrust a pike into the old judge so was gaius gracchus responsible for the murder of antullius it is useless in such cases to plead blameless character and patriotic intentions moreover the friends of gaius did not even take the trouble to excuse themselves fulvius flaccus when the assembly had broken up called together a mob of his supporters harangued them and armed them with a store of weapons which lay in his house for he possessed a complete arsenal of gallic broadswords and lances 
the trophies of his successful campaign of B.C. 125. He and his reckless satellites passed the night in noise, riot, and carousing. The ex-consul himself, it is said, was the first man drunk, and in his cups uttered many obiter dicta, most unbecoming in one who was about to plunge the city into war next morning. The behavior of Gaius was very different. He burst into tears on leaving the forum and shut himself up in his room, gloomily pondering over the end to which two years of civic power had brought him. But though he did not commit himself to any overt course of action, a great mob of his partisans gathered round his house and encamped about it all night. Another mass collected in the capital before dawn to occupy the points of vantage for the struggle, which was expected to break out in the morning. Meanwhile, Opimius and the other foes of the Democratic Party had been making much more practical preparations. The consul had ordered every senator and every knight of the Optimate Party to provide two fully armed men. He had taken command of a body of Cretan mercenaries who chanced to be passing through the city and had ordered a general muster of the clients and retainers of his friends. They were a formidable band, and with the magistrates at their head, they had the inestimable advantage of appearing to represent law and order. Protected by this mass of special constables, the Senate met next morning. The consul began to lay before them the desperate state of affairs and the necessity for outlawing the democratic leaders. At this moment, by a preconcerted arrangement, the beer of Antullius, followed by his mourning friends, was borne past the doors of the Senate House. The fathers rushed out and burst forth into exaggerated demonstrations of horror and sympathy. Then, flocking back to their seats, they passed the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, which empowered the consuls in the usual terms to take care that the Republic might receive no harm. Rome was thus put under martial law, and as a last formality, messengers were sent to Gracchus and to Fulvius Flaccus, bidding them repair in person to the Curia in order to give an account of their doings. Frightened at the great armed force around the Senate House, the Democrats had begun to concentrate on the Aventine. They were almost destitute of guidance, for Gaius was sunk in a melancholy apathy, and Flaccus was barely recovered from the effects of last night's debauch. It was with difficulty that he could be roused at all that morning. The only intention displayed was to stand at bay on the old plebeian stronghold. No offensive action seems even to have been contemplated. But the temple of Diana and the neighboring streets were barricaded, and emissaries ran round the city calling the multitude to arms, and even promising freedom to any slaves who should join them. This last anarchic proposal must have disposed of any chance that Gaius might gain support among his old allies of the equestrian order. The very name of a slave rising was enough to make an optimate of every man of independent means. It was probably the perception of the fact that the number of their partisans on the Aventine was much smaller than they had expected, which led the democratic leaders to negotiate before opening hostilities. When they received the message from the Senate which bade them come down and justify their actions, Gaius, it is said, seriously proposed to take his life in his hands and obey the summons. But Flaccus objected to put himself in the power of the enemy. He would only consent to send his son Quintus with a reply, in which the garrison of the Aventine offered to lay down its arms and disperse, if a complete amnesty was offered to every citizen, small or great. It is said that many of the senators were not indisposed to accept these terms. Except to fanatics, anything is better than civil war. But Opimius carried a majority with him when he declared that traitors could not send ambassadors, but should come in person to surrender themselves to justice before they sued for mercy. The young Flaccus was sent back to his father and told not to come again unless he brought with him an offer of unconditional surrender. After some futile debating between the leaders of the Democrats, the proposal to capitulate without terms was negatived, and the son of Flaccus was once more dispatched to the Senate with a second set of offers. Opimius told him that he had been warned not to return, 
and that he had forfeited any claims to be considered an ambassador he cast the young man into prison and ordered his armbands to converge upon the aventine then he published a notice that any one who laid down his arms before fighting began should be granted an amnesty but that gracchus and fulvius were public enemies and that whoever brought their heads to the consuls should be paid for them their actual weight in gold the rumour of this proclamation and the sight of the optimate bands working upwards among the streets that led to the summit of the aventine was too much for the resolution of most of the democrats a great many slunk off to their houses while yet it was time but enough remained to defend the barricades and for some little space there was sharp fighting between the two parties but the cretan archers so galled the democrats that ere long they gave back from their position and the assailants stormed the hilltop and burst in among them then followed a massacre no less than three thousand persons are said to have been slain and their bodies cast into the tiber fulvius flaccus and his elder son marcus hid themselves in the house of a client but when their pursuers threatened to burn down the whole street unless they were given up an informer was promptly forthcoming they were beheaded on the spot without form of trial gaius gracchus was not found upon the aventine no one had seen him during the fighting he had shut himself up in the temple of diana and proposed to commit suicide when the barricades were forced but two of his friends the knights pomponius and litorius took his dagger from him and persuaded him to fly before it was yet too late there was still a way of escape by the porta trigemina and the Sublician bridge before leaving the temple gaius is said to have fallen upon his knees and with upraised hands to have prayed to the goddess that the people of rome for their ingratitude and base desertion of their friend might be slaves for ever if the story is true it well explains the mood of sullen despair which had lain heavy on his heart for the last twenty-four hours he had pushed things to extremity and then his party had melted away from him all his plans as he now saw had been futile from the first because he had mistaken the urban rabble of to-day for the ancient citizens of rome gaius and his two friends were sighted by some of the victorious optimates as they fled down toward the tiber they made what speed they could but the reformer presently stumbled and fell spraining his ankle so that he could no longer move with ease by the river gate the pursuers were nearing them thereupon pomponius bravely turned to bay and held the back for a moment at the cost of his life litorius did as much on the Sublician bridge and by their sacrifice gaius now accompanied only by a single slave reached the suburb under the geniculum beyond the water as he hobbled on supported by his retainer the streets were full of idle spectators who shouted to him to run his best as if he were a competitor in the circus but no one gave him the least assistance though he kept calling for a horse as he went before the optimates came up he had got beyond the last houses and reached the grove of farina just outside the city he was seen to enter it but when the pursuers burst in after him they found both him and his companion lying dead at his master's orders the slave had stabbed him to the heart and had then turned his weapon against himself the head of the reformer was cut off and carried to the consul his body was cast into the tiber opimius carried out his promise and gave the bearer of the head its weight in gold seventeen pounds eight ounces as tradition recorded thus miserably ended the career of the younger gracchus a man who both as a politician and as an individual was strangely compacted of strength and weakness clearly he was no single-minded enthusiast like his brother he had studied statecraft and had learnt not to be over-scrupulous in his methods if indeed he was set on regenerating the people of rome he chose the strangest allies and employed the most doubtful means he must have been perfectly well aware of what he was doing when he purchased the support of the urban rabble by the gift of the corn dole and that of the greedy equites by surrendering to them the unhappy province of asia when the means are so obviously immoral one is driven into doubting the purity of the end which they are intended to subserve was gracchus really set on saving rome from the economic and constitutional perils which were sapping her strength 
or was he rather an ambitious politician yearning for power at all costs and eager to revenge on the senate his brother's death it is easy to read his career in either light yet each reading must be full of contradictions if we hold with Momsen that gaius was deliberately trying to make himself tyrant of rome we can easily understand all the less worthy episodes of his career the man with such an idea in his head would not have shrunk from using unworthy tools or practising any sort of political charlatanry to purchase the aid of the rabble or the knights by bribes to flatter the hopes of the italians who desired the franchise would be appropriate moves for one who aimed at repeating the career of Kypsilis or Pisistratus. But this theory leaves unexplained the reluctance which Gaius manifested at the end to engage in actual civil war, the want of energy which he displayed in organizing his party for the final conflict, and the melancholy apathy which he showed during the last twenty-four hours of his life. If he had really aimed at supreme power, such conduct could be explained by physical cowardice alone, and of that not even his enemies dared to accuse him. A would-be tyrant would have armed and organized bravos, have attacked the Senate instead of assuming the defensive, and have thrown himself into the battle with frantic energy. All the doings of Gaius, on the other hand, are those of a man forced into violence against his will, and obviously doubting whether death was not preferable to the guilt of stirring up civil war, they are not the acts of one who wishes to grasp at supreme power and cares not how it is attained on the other hand as we have already seen it is still more impossible to explain his career by representing him as a single-hearted friend of the people who thought nothing of himself and only aimed at regenerating the roman state ambition revenge the reckless use of unworthy methods are too easily discernible in many of his actions Probably the true way of reconciling the contradictions of the life of Gaius is to realize that though he possessed many of the instincts of the tyrant and the demagogue, there was also latent in him much of the ancient Roman civic virtue. He loved to rule, he was unscrupulous in his methods, he hated fiercely the optimates and all their works, but at the same time he had a genuine wish to serve the state he showed it by persisting in his schemes for transmarine colonization and the enfranchisement of the italians long after they had become unpopular a mere self-seeker would have dropped them the moment that he was certain that they failed to please the rabble of the comitia when at last he found himself borne on irresistibly toward civil war gaius was deeply grieved he faced it with reluctance and finally had it thrust upon him against his will by the reckless folly of his subordinates the responsibility no doubt must ultimately rest upon his shoulders he might have retired to bide his time instead of fighting but to do so was almost impossible he was surrounded by excited partisans whom he could not control and if he had gone back he would have seemed to be betraying them to his and their enemies the outburst of actual war and the reformers dreadful end were melancholy but inevitable end of section 5。section 6 of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter 4 from the gracchi to sulla bc 121 to 88 part 1 Gaius Gracchus was a striking example of the truth of the melancholy adage that the evil that men do lives after them, the good is oft interred with their bones. For among all the many measures that he brought before the Roman people, precisely those which were evil in their tendency survived him, while those wherein lay the seeds of good were thrust aside and ignored for another generation. The corn dole which he had invented proved so popular that the victorious optimates dared not meddle with it it remained as a permanent curse pauperizing and demoralizing the city multitude and ruining what was left of italian agriculture the new equestrian jury courts sold justice so shamelessly for the next thirty years that men began at last to talk of the period when the senators had been judges as the good old times the asiatic tithe farming went on 
and gradually ruined that fine province besides provoking therein such a virulent hatred of rome that as we have already pointed out when the asiatics got their first chance of revolt in the days of king mithridates they rose like one man and massacred eighty thousand roman citizens in a single day but the two really valuable remedies for the ills of the state which gracchus had advocated were thrust aside if not forgotten transmarine colonization was stopped and the new settlement at carthage was destroyed the italians were commanded to give up all idea of obtaining the franchise indeed special care was taken to close the various avenues by which individuals had hitherto found it possible to slip into the citizen body as to the agrarian law which tiberius had framed and gaius had reenacted the senate did not formally repeal it nor did they give back the confiscated land to the possessores they simply removed one by one the gracchan checks on the economic tendency of the times and allow the new farmers to die out by slow extinction livius drusus it will be remembered had made the gracchan allotments alienable and abolished the ground rent due from them even before gaius fell in b c one nineteen a law was passed which dissolved the land commission so that no further distribution could be made it also provided that such domain land as still remained in the hands of the original possessores should be secured to them on condition of their paying a small rent which was to be employed in subsidizing the ever-growing needs of the corn dole lastly in b c one eleven a third law was passed which removed this rent and made the land into the freehold private property of the occupiers the moment that they got the opportunity of alienating their farms under the law of drusus the gracchan holders began to dispose of them agriculture did not and could not pay political economy exerted its iron law and the allotments were sold for what they would fetch to the nearest capitalist the latifundia once more commenced to grow and the decrease in the number of small landowners is marked from b c one eighteen onward by the regular shrinkage of the census returns by the end of the century it is probable that the whole effect of the gracchan redistribution of land had passed away only a few years later it was said doubtless with gross exaggeration that the larger part of the land of roman italy was in the hands of no more than two thousand proprietors meanwhile it must be remembered that the senate never thoroughly recovered that undisputed control of all the machinery of the state which it had possessed in the old days before the appearance of the gracchi it never dared to strike at the equestrian order which remained as a permanent check on its omnipotence even when the abuse of the law courts by the knights had grown into a perfect scandal the senate refused to commit itself to an attack upon such a powerful body of enemies apparently the leading optimates lived in a state of constant apprehension that a new gracchus might at any moment arise to dispute their authority and wished to do no more than to avoid friction and hang on to the emoluments of power they managed by a policy of short-sighted opportunism to maintain their ascendancy from year to year till at last after a considerable interval the democratic party again found leaders and a program and civic strife recommenced from the death of gaius gracchus in b c one twenty one down to the appearance of marius on the political stage in b c one o six the democratic program lay dormant the history of the time turns mainly on questions of foreign policy and it was by their incompetent management of those questions that the optimates finally gave their adversaries a chance of raising their heads it was not an age of peace all through these years the people were muttering and murmuring occasionally there were riots or an unpopular magistrate was impeached or a law backed by the senate was rejected by the comitia but there was no continuous agitation for any definite political end nor did any leader succeed in rallying the democratic faction for a new attack on the senate as the constitution then stood a single omnipotent leader provided with the tribunate or some other important magistracy was needed to galvanize the sovereign people into activity it could only put forth its strength if guided by an autocratic chief 
using the one-man power which a democracy really loves, and the chief was long in coming. Meanwhile, the main thread of the annals of Rome consists of the history of two long foreign wars, both grossly mismanaged by the Senate at home and by the incapable oligarchs who were sent out to bear rule in the provinces. These were the lingering Jugurthine troubles, B.C. 117 to 105, and the dangerous Cimbrian War, B.C. 113 to 101. It is unfortunate that while we possess an elaborate, if not altogether trustworthy, narrative of the African affair in Sallust's Jugurtha, the story of the far more important Cimbrian campaigns has to be gathered from imperfect notes in Plutarch, Appian, and the Epitome of Livy. It was in consequence of the Jugurthine War that the Democrats first began to raise their heads again. The facts of the Senate's maladministration were sufficiently disgraceful. The king of a not very powerful subject state had broken all his treaties, slain off the cousins whom the Senate had made his colleagues, and done whatever he pleased in Africa, without paying the least attention to the commands of the suzerain power. When embassies of remonstrance were sent him, he had merely quieted the envoys by judicious bribes, combined with lavish promises of submission. He carried on this shameless policy for five years, from 117 B.C. to 112, and might have persisted even longer in it, if he had not let the savage break out in him at an inauspicious moment. When he crushed his last surviving cousin by the capture of Serta in B.C. 112, he massacred not only the Numidian garrison, but a great number of Roman and Italian residents in the place. This atrocity so much aroused the anger of the Roman people that the Senate was forced to declare war on Jugurtha. It was abominably mismanaged of the two imbecile generals to whom the subjection of Numidia was first entrusted, one granted the king terms of peace which the indignant people refused to ratify, the second so misconducted himself that his army was scattered, beaten, and sent under the yoke. These disasters roused a tempest of wrath at Rome. Public opinion was so strongly excited that under a temporary leader, one Mamilius Limitanus, the people created a court of high commission, which raged against the prominent members of the optimate ring, sent into exile the two incompetent generals Bestia and Albinus, and revenged an old grudge by packing off after them Opimius, the consul who in B.C. 121 had put down Gracchus and his friends with such cruel zeal. But in spite of this outburst, the Senate was not yet deprived of the control of foreign affairs, and was allowed to send forth against Jugurtha its best fighting man, Quintus Caecilius Metullus, B.C. 109. The new general was fairly successful, but he did not work quickly enough to please the angry critics of the Forum. He took most of Jugurtha's fortresses, but the king fled into the Atlas and the Sahara, and maintained a desperate guerrilla warfare which seemed likely to linger on forever. The people were perhaps unjustly dissatisfied. They did not understand, as we understand only too well in this year of grace 1902, the difficulties of hunting down elusive bands of marauding light horse. It was at this moment that there at last appeared a serious candidate for the headship of the Democratic Party. Gaius Marius was a man of a very different type from his predecessors in that post. He was a rude soldier who had risen from the ranks by his hard head and undaunted courage. He had none of the literary polish and philosophic training or the lofty eloquence of the two Gracchi. As a politician, he can only be described as a blatant demagogue. He had not the brains or the imagination to sketch out a political program. He was no more than a discontented and ambitious veteran with a personal grievance. His simple method of achieving notoriety was to declaim to the multitude concerning the very real abuses of the senatorial government and to promise to set all to rights if he were made consul. He most unjustly blamed Metullus for the protraction of the war, and promised to end everything in a year if only he were placed in office. He had been provoked by the aristocratic hauteur and quiet insolence of the proconsul, and was thinking quite as much of revenging personal slights to himself 
as of giving the democratic party an opportunity of seizing the reins of power the vulgar self-assertion and coarse invective of marius did not disgust the multitude he was duly elected and straightway went over to africa to supersede metullus the province was not assigned to him by the senate in spite of their opposition he had a bill passed in the assembly which gave him charge of the numidian war but though he took large reinforcements with him legions raised on a new system by volunteers from the lower orders of the city he was not at first much more successful than his predecessor he scoured the whole countryside with movable columns but he could not catch the evasive jugurtha his reputation might have been wrecked if chance had not come to his aid his quaestor lucius cornelius sulla at last succeeded in capturing the numidian king not by force of arms but by treachery he bribed jugurtha's moorish allies to seize and surrender their guest the king was kidnapped and made over to marius and then the war came suddenly to an end b c 105 marius had redeemed his promise to put an end to the numidian struggle though the method in which it closed was neither glorious nor dignified but he had saved his reputation and was able to celebrate a triumph and to pose before his supporters as a successful general at the moment of his return he had the state at his mercy for the senate was cowed and the people would have been ready to grant anything he asked moreover he had legions at his back the democracy for the first time was armed with sword and shield and did not depend on the stones and staves of riotous mobs if external troubles had not intervened there must have been a political explosion of some sort in b c one o five one o four it might very possibly have ended in the installation of marius as temporary ruler of rome but neither he nor the senate had the leisure to turn their attention to domestic politics for the first time since the fall of hannibal a serious danger from without was impending over italy the year b c one o five witnessed the most dreadful disaster to the roman arms with the possible exception of cannae that ever occurred in the days of the republic for the last eight years there had been unrest along the northern frontier of the empire both in the balkan peninsula and in the alpine lands all the unknown barbarism of central europe was on the move tribe was thrusting upon tribe and the outer waves of the seething whirlpool of nations were washing against the borders of the provinces of macedonia and narbonese gaul at first the troubles were not serious the attention of rome was distracted to the jugurthine war and little attention was paid to the raids of the celts or germans but things gradually grew worse several small roman armies were cut to pieces there were mishaps of some importance in one thirteen one o nine and one o seven at last the situation grew so threatening that the senate dispatched two large armies a dozen legions of raw recruits to defend the frontiers of gaul for the originators of all the stress and turmoil the great mass of migratory bands whom we vaguely know under the name of cimbri and teutons had thrust aside the lesser tribes and were marching against italy itself an awful disaster ensued the two incapable quarrelsome generals malleus and caepio found the invaders on the lower rhone and attacked them with foolhardy confidence they did not even combine their forces though their camps were less than a day's march apart caepio in disobedience to the orders of his superior attacked the enemy's camp in the morning he was defeated and his legions annihilated in the afternoon the germans threw themselves upon malleus slew him and cut to pieces the whole of the second roman army eighty thousand men fell in the two battles of arausio october sixth one o five not a cohort remained to guard the passes of the alps the only hope of rome was in the army which marius was bringing from africa if the barbarians had marched at once for turin or genoa it is hard to say what they might not have accomplished but they lingered long in the valley of the rhone and then to the surprise of all men drifted away toward the pyrenees instead of crossing the alps thus rome was given the chance of reorganizing the defence of her frontiers 
and marius instead of practising demagogy in the forum hurried northward with his troops to interpose between the barbarians and the gates of italy the cimbrian war contrary to all expectation was protracted for five summers from b c 105 to 101 and marius re-elected year after year to the consulship was kept perpetually in the field watching for the moment when the enemy should at last make up their minds to deliver their great stroke it was not till they had wandered far and wide in spain and gaul spreading devastation around them that the barbarians turned back at last to the true objective and marched in two vast columns against italy the teutons by the nearer route through provence the cimbri by the longer sweep that leads through southern germany by the brenner pass and the line of the adige down to verona marius now showed that at least his reputation as a soldier had not been exaggerated we must not linger over the details of his two great victories in 102 he warred down the teutons in a long-running fight among the hills of provence which ended with their complete destruction at the battle of aquae sextiae in the following spring he crossed the alps into italy to meet the cimbri who had at last completed their long circular march and had descended into the plains of the po at vercelli he annihilated them with a slaughter as great as that of his teutonic victory in the preceding year the disaster of malleus and caepio was revenged and rome was safe from the northern invader for another five hundred years End of section six section seven of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles ullman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four from the gracchi to sulla b c one twenty one to eighty eight part two the man who had put an end to the long nightmare of fear which had hung over the city from the day of arausio to that of vercelli might have asked and obtained from the people any reward that he might choose they offered libations to him as if he were a god and hailed him as the third founder of rome he might have been her eighth king had he known the right way in which to sue for the sceptre and the diadem but the great general was the most bungling and incompetent of politicians his naive vanity and clumsy ostentation made him ere long ridiculous a grave fault in a pretender to supreme power the optimate sneered at his solecisms in grammar and in dress these might have been imperceptible to the multitude but even they were forced to laugh at a consul who was always trying to make great political harangues and breaking down hopelessly in the middle the firmness which he displayed in battle did not accompany him into the assembly and the least interruption or distraction disconcerted him so that he promptly became incoherent moreover even the rabble would have preferred a leader who did not mix vulgar familiarity with vainglorious ostentation in such a curious measure and who could have concealed more successfully his growing addiction to the wine-cup but in spite of all his obvious defects marius was firmly convinced that he was to be not only the preserver of rome from the barbarians but also the destined saviour of society who was to take up the task of the gracchi and to tear the administration of the empire from the incapable hands of the senate a little experience convinced him that he was not really suited for the work of a mob orator nor for the drawing up of an elaborate political programme of reforms but the only result of this discovery was to make him resolve to take into his pay useful persons capable of writing his speeches and drafting his bills for him he must find tools and mouthpieces who would act as his agents in the work of revolution unskilful in every political action marius enlisted as his managing partners two able and reckless scoundrels whose disreputability was to be the ruin both of himself and of the democratic cause these two choice spirits lucius apuleius saturninus and c servilius glaucia were the roman counterparts of the cleophons and hyperbole of athens 
the former was a contentious obstinate man who as quaestor in 104 had a quarrel with the senate in which he considered that he was ill-treated since then he had devoted himself to the career of malcontent and exposer of abuses in b c 103 he had obtained the tribunate and had used its power by bringing perpetual charges of bribery or misconduct against unpopular optimates by raising mobs and by sweeping the streets whenever the spirit seized him he was now anxious to take another turn of tribunicial power his colleague glaucia seems to have been a shade less violent but even more insolent and disreputable his special talent lay in the direction of vulgar and indecent stump oratory with which he could always keep the multitude on the roar having enlisted the support of this precious pair marius started on his career as a democratic reformer he allowed saturninus to draw up the program for him he for his part was to support it with the majesty of his military reputation and if necessary by calling in the aid of his disbanded veterans who were loafing about the city by thousands living on the great donatives which they had received at the end of the cimbric war the platform of the revived democratic party consisted of a reproduction with some slight variations of the schemes of gaius gracchus the permanent support of the urban mob was to be bought by a grotesque exaggeration of that statesman's detestable corn law the dole had been issued to the citizens since b c one twenty two at the rate of six and a half asses per modius saturninus proposed to sell the corn for the ridiculous price of five sixths of an ass he might as well have given it away for nothing less objectionable by far was the revival of gracchus's great scheme for transmarine colonization saturninus had already proposed to revive the gracchan scheme of colonizing africa for the benefit of the veterans of the jugurthine war now he produced a grandiose scheme for transmarine colonization on the largest scale it included a law for the planting of colonies in achaia macedonia and sicily and another for the distribution of great regions both in gaul and in africa among the victorious soldiery of the cimbric war marius was to be entrusted with the execution of the whole vast scheme the italians were also to be pacified by this measure for they were to be included in the gallic distribution and each settler was to receive full burgess rights saturninus had grasped the fact that the city rabble on whose votes he had to subsist objected to the enfranchised italians at home who might cram the form and scramble for doles but had no objection to the enfranchised italian who had been packed off to africa or central gaul out of sight would be out of mind his colonization scheme therefore was contrived to play a double part in satisfying the veterans and in pacifying the allies in strict accordance with gracchan precedents bills were added to strengthen the already overgreat power of the equites in the law courts but there was a most original novelty included in the apulean law the reckless tribune subjoined to it a clause compelling every senator to swear obedience to the whole code within five days of its passing the comitia on pain of losing his seat for intolerant suppression of adverse opinion no more stringent device had ever been invented the senate as a power in the state would have been annihilated if it had been forced to submit to such ordinances but it was not so much the contents of the apulean laws which proved fatal to their framer and his patron as the way in which the laws were carried saturninus's whole career was a carnival of violence and outrage he habitually went about attended by turbulent mobs who beat or slew any one who dared to differ from their idol his followers were capable of anything in the tribunicial elections for b c one hundred it seemed probable that he would fail to be chosen thereupon a band of his satellites fell upon and stoned to death quintus nonius one of the successful candidates saturninus was elected to fill the vacant place it was just possible to look upon this sinister coincidence as the work of chance 
but no one could mistake its meaning when precisely the same thing happened at the consular elections for the succeeding year glaucia was a candidate under the protection of saturninus and marius it seemed likely that he might be beaten by gaius memmius a man who though now a moderate member of the optimate party had been a very popular tribune of the plebs eleven years before and had headed the agitation against the mismanagement of the jugurthine war the moment that his candidature was seen to be dangerous memmius was set upon by a gang of ruffians and beaten to death these were perhaps the most shocking of the deeds of marius's enterprising lieutenant but his general behaviour was quite in keeping with them when the law dealing with the corn dole in the gallic colonies was before the comitia some optimate tribunes tried to interpose their veto saturninus did not take the trouble to deal with them as tiberius gracchus had dealt with octavius he simply had them thrown off the rostra and went on with the proceedings the evicted magistrates though much knocked about struggled to the front and began crying that they heard thunder on the left which should have brought the meeting to an end but saturninus pointing with a menacing gesture to the stones which his followers were gathering up told them that they had better beware or it would not only rain but hail the tribunes discreetly fled but a hot-headed young optimate the quaestor quintus caepio collected a band of his clients and supporters girt up his toga and stormed the rostra upsetting saturninus and those about him the assailants were but a handful and the demagogue rallying his forces and putting marian veterans in his front rank charged back drove off caepio and his gang and completed the formalities of passing the bill among desperate noise confusion and tumult it was farcical to call such a mere riot a legal meeting of the comitia or to hold that bills which had been vetoed by half a dozen tribunes had any binding force but it was for refusing to swear obedience to them that quintus metellus the haughty but honest and capable predecessor of marius in numidia was driven into exile there seemed to be no length to which saturninus and glaucio would not go but their triumphant violence defeated their own ends marius was prepared to wink at a good deal of ruffianism on the part of his supporters but he drew the line at the systematic murder of respectable opponents and would have preferred to see the opposite party in the assembly overawed by threats rather than driven out with sticks and stones clearly he began to fear his own lieutenants and to doubt whether they might not turn against him instead of merely carrying out his plans he suddenly dropped his support of them secretly informed the optimates that he would not be responsible for their acts and passed the word round among his veterans that they were to remain neutral exasperated at being disavowed by their employer saturninus and glaucia tried to continue their wild career on their own behalf and in december b c one hundred brought matters to a head by seizing the capital with the object of carrying through a regular coup d'etat what exactly they intended to accomplish we cannot guess certainly it can hardly have been as their enemies asserted to proclaim saturninus king or even dictator but deprived of the aid of the veterans of marius they proved no more able to defend themselves than gaius gracchus and fulvius had been in b c one twenty one the optimates easily shut them in and held them beleaguered while the senate proclaimed martial law marius much against his will was forced to lend his sanction as consul to their proceedings when the besiegers had succeeded in cutting off the supply of water from the capital saturninus and his crew were forced to surrender they were placed under a guard in the senate house by the orders of marius but the optimate mob tore off the roof and pelted the prisoners to death with tiles before the consul could interfere thus ended the third attempt of the democratic party to seize the conduct of affairs and to make an end of the senate as a governing body it failed mainly from the incapacity of marius either to conduct a political campaign himself or to select agents who would be competent to do so in his behalf if he had known how to secure men of tact and discretion instead of reckless incendiaries he might have done what he pleased for the strength of his reputation would have carried everything before it in b c one o one 
and the arms of his veterans were at his disposal but saturninus in spite of a certain ability and energy was frankly impossible either as leader or lieutenant he would have wrecked any cause by his insolence and recklessness marius much disappointed by the failure of his schemes and more or less conscious of the ridiculous figure which he had cut retired from rome when his consulship was over and went for a long tour in asia under the pretext of fulfilling a vow which he had made during the cimbrian war to the gods of the east when he returned he found that he had been half forgotten and that the senate was more powerful than it had been at any time since the fall of the gracchi there was a gap of more than eight years before any serious political strife again arose at rome but the unsatisfactory economic and constitutional position of the republic once more produced its inevitable result and a new reformer arose marcus livius drusus differed from his predecessors in that he was in no sense a legitimate descendant of the gracchi he was what in modern phraseology we should call a tory democrat he believed that the senate was far more fitted than the assembly to administer the empire he had taken part against saturninus in b c one hundred and his views as to what were the main dangers of the state and how these dangers should be met differed from those which were held by the democratic party in personal character he was as unlike saturninus and glaucia as can well be imagined being a man of very staid and even haughty carriage extremely strict in his morals and self-conscious beyond the limits of priggishness he was so well aware of his own virtues that his dying words are recorded to have been that he wondered how many years would elapse before the state would get another citizen as good as himself after having studied for several years the unsatisfactory condition of the republic drusus had come to the conclusion that its main dangers were the ever-growing power and insolence of the equestrian order the corporation of financiers to whom gaius gracchus had sacrificed the state and the discontent of the italian allies he also thought that something might still be done to re-establish the yeoman class by providing new colonies at capua an old idea of gaius gracchus's and in sicily there was nothing in these views which might not be held by a sincere optimate and drusus found that he might look for support from all the more enlightened members of the senate for the first time a reformer was backed by a large proportion of the most important men in the state the better sort of senators had long been chafing at the corruption of the equestrian law courts and of late the condemnation of the virtuous rutilius rufus for his blameless government in asia had provoked them beyond endurance as to the question of giving the franchise to the allies any sensible optimate could see that the existing constituency in the comitia was as bad from his point of view as any other body that could be created it could do no harm if the urban multitude were deluded or even swamped by the sturdy farmers of those parts of central italy to which agricultural depression had not yet penetrated the agrarian law too which drusus proposed had not the confiscatory character of that of tiberius gracchus the campanian state domains and the other small remnants of public land in italy were being held on lease they had not practically passed into private possession as had the estates which had been resumed by the gracchan law of b c one thirty three and to colonies in sicily no one could have any rational objection the fertile island had been so wasted by the slave war of b c one o four to one o one that it could afford to take in a very large body of new settlers it is impossible to deny that the reforms of drusus were less objectionable and had a more respectable and influential set of supporters than any other of the programmes which were laid before the roman people during the last century of the republic unfortunately their author did not introduce them in the best or wisest fashion the bills had to pass the comitia and that corrupt constituency had to be conciliated thinking that the agrarian law would not suffice to buy it over drusus linked to his other proposals one of a most openly immoral sort he offered to increase the pernicious corn dole by adding to the amount of state grain which each citizen was allowed to purchase every month it was represented to him that the treasury could not stand the expense wherefore he enacted that the coinage should be debased in order to find the extra money 
of every eight denarii issued by the mint one was to be of copper plated with silver and to refuse the base coin was to be a high offence evidently drusus was no economist but even though the ancient world had not discovered gresham's law that the bad money drives out the good he must have known that his bill would cause grave financial troubles it was clearly a case of doing evil that good might come drusus found himself at the head of a very heterogeneous body of partisans his proposals had caused a cleavage in both of the old factions he was backed by the better half of the senate by the italians and at first by that blind and greedy majority in the assembly which would vote anything that was sweetened by a corn dole against him were the equites and that section of the senate which was simply reactionary and opposed to all manner of change merely because it was change he had also to reckon with that part of the urban multitude which regarded the extension of the franchise to the italians with such distaste that they feared and shunned any one who might propose it quite conscious of the existence of this latter body drusus with more willingness than honesty brought forward together his laws for depriving the equites of the control of the courts for planting the colonies in italy and sicily and for increasing the corn dole to do so directly contravened the lex caecilia didia passed in b c ninety eight which forbade the introduction of clauses dealing with several distinct subjects under a single preamble nevertheless the proposals were carried in face of a bitter opposition headed by the consul marcius philippus the meeting at which they passed was much disturbed and the adversaries were so vehement that at last drusus had philippus dragged off the rostrum by his apparitors an outburst of temper which unhappily recalled the doings of saturninus his bill passed but its legality was very doubtful in face of his opponent's contention that subjects so different could not legally be linked together in one enactment End of section seven